Good evening and welcome to another American Quarantine edition of the Wednesday night Bible study at Calvary Chapel of Leesburg during our uh, virus pandemic stay at home orders. Uh, this is April the 29th, April 29th, the year of our Lord, 2020. We will be finishing up chapter two in the book of Proverbs tonight. I hope that this has been a good week for you uh, as far as getting into God's word and learning more and becoming uh, just deeper and more intimate with God in the knowledge of the Holy One. And I ask, uh, I've asked God to give me um, good things to read, good things to learn. And when I am in his word, I've asked him to help me to discern uh, his wisdom. So I want his, I want his shield. I want his, uh, him guarding my ways as we discussed last week. I'm going to open in prayer and then we'll get started. Lord God, I pray that you would, uh, I pray that you'd be with us tonight, that you would teach us your ways, that you would teach us knowledge of you, the Holy One, that, Lord, you would show us how wisdom can protect us. You would show us, please, how we can uh, please you in our, in our walk. Lord, for everybody that we know who is ill, uh, for everybody who is uh, in a bad way, God, we pray that you would use this time to build into their heart, build into their lives, and that you would uh, bring your will about for them in their life, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that you also pray for our leaders, for those in government over us, for our civil authorities, and that uh, as we are approaching May 1st very soon, and that has been named as a target date for reopening the economy, for um, starting to reopen the country more to regular commerce, I'm pre-recording this at an earlier date, so there may be some news updates since then. I would like to just uh, mention that, um, and we can talk about this later in Proverbs. We did hear once the governor of New York in talking about how he's um, rather uh, completely uh, shutting down the economy there. And of course, there's the essential personnel are free to go about their business and so on. But he was, he was criticized by some for that. A couple of things I want to point out. Number one is we, we don't all know what pressures the governor of New York is up against. Uh, we don't have perfect knowledge of his, uh, what he knows behind the scenes. So I encourage us all not to be super critical of the various governors of the country as they do what um, they've been elected to do. Frankly, we elected them to office and we have the government that we asked for. So then it's our time to pray for our leaders and to support them, especially these executives, the president of the United States, the vice president, the governors of the 50 states, uh, and it's our duty then to pray that God would give them his wisdom in guiding them through this time, both of in instituting protections and also of lifting barriers to commerce. Now, I, I do want to mention one thing that I would encourage you to look into, and as I have done in the last week or so. The governor of New York made a statement that if, if all of this that I'm doing saves just one life, it will have been worth it. That is a good, interesting point for discussion. And uh, with all due respect to the governor, I would say, perhaps, sir, it's maybe not that simple. I know that governors and presidents and legislatures make decisions all the time about how we will self-govern and how we will live. And there are, there are consequences to just about everything that we do. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of liberties can be lost by saying, I 
I want to solve a problem to perfection and that perfection means a successful result, means that not one single person dies. So I'm sad to say that it doesn't really work that way in, in, in our human life, in this fallen world. People die all the time from all kinds of things, whether from war, pestilence, from their own personal decisions, or just, for example, from the speed limit. Remember some of you um, years ago, there was a federal changing of the freeway speed limits to a maximum speed of 55 miles per hour on all roadways in the United States. And then there, then there came a time to lift that barrier and let, this, let the 50 states decide what they were going to do in their own states. Whether they wanted to have 60, 65 miles an hour, 70, 75 in Texas and Wyoming and Montana, I think, 80 or, or more. Um, and that's for each state to make those decisions. But every state knew that when they raised the speed limit from 55 miles an hour, people would die. More people would die. And if you wanted to save more lives even than 55 miles an hour, we were always free to lower the speed limit to 35 miles an hour. But there's trade-offs in everything. Life is dangerous. And we can explore these principles later in the scripture. If you have some questions that you wish to formulate for us to have a discussion in our Wednesday night study, um, give me those questions. Email them to me, and I'll be happy to maybe prepare a special discussion for us to have. This time of these Wednesday night Bible studies is not always just me making the decisions and presenting the church with what I think we need to discuss or learn every week. I'm, as you know, I'm very open to, if you have a serious question or an issue that you'd like to see explored, ask me about it. I will do my very best to respond to that. If it doesn't seem like something to respond to publicly in the Wednesday night Bible study, then I'll be happy to give you a call or come to your house or just go to lunch with you and just discuss those things as I do with numerous people in the church. But um, if it seems like something that would be good for discussion, sure, we'll craft a, a teaching around that. And not that I'm the source and, uh, and the end of all knowledge. Um, I'd like to hear what you have to say about it and what, you, what your exploration of Scripture brings about as well. So now, enough about that. Back to our study in Proverbs chapter 2. We saw that in Proverbs chapter 1, that the purpose of the book of Proverbs was to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man give knowledge and discretion. And then the first section here that I'm referring to says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So let's keep this in mind as we go through the book of Proverbs, that the purpose is to give us wisdom and to give us instruction in justice, judgment, and equity so that we can be pleasing to God in all our ways. So we left off last week at chapter 2, verse 9. And uh, just by way of quick review, we saw that the whole chapter 2 is... Uh, is an offer from uh, God uh, spoken through two parents. A mother and a father are speaking to their son who is, uh, we presume, is a believer already. And they are, they are telling him how to be even a better believer, more pleasing to God, and they're giving him information that will make his life more successful, that will make him wiser and more pleasing to God, and that will then tend to result in in him being able to enjoy God's favor, in him being able to enjoy God being a shield to him, a guard to him, someone who preserves his paths and someone who directs their son. Don't we pray that for all of our children? We really do. Um, and let's pray that right now. Lord God, I ask that you would uh, give us the kind of heart that wants to seek after you and that, would, that you would respond to with shielding us from the evil one, with guarding our ways, with preserving our paths. And God, just make our lives pleasing to you as we seek wisdom in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
So let's begin then, and I will, I'll start in chapter 2, verse 9, and we'll uh, read through uh, verse uh, 22, and then we'll hopefully get through that, that whole section tonight. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 9. I'll start with 8. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the perverse man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Who, will, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who are devious in their paths, to deliver you from the immoral woman, and from the seductress who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. None who go to her return nor do they regain the paths of life. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. For the upright will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. God, we ask you to, to include us in the righteous ones and help us to live that righteous life which is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we saw that this was one big if-then statement that began earlier. Uh, my son, if you treasure my words, if you treasure my words, uh, or receive my words, treasure my commandments within you, etc., etc., then these things will happen to you. And so we saw, then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. So there's those words again. Righteousness, justice, equity, and every good path. We talked last week about the activists who uh, get out and hold up signs of protest, protesting injustice and inequity. And we talked last week about how they probably don't really even understand what injustice is or inequity is because the Bible here is saying that they need to understand the knowledge of God in order to understand about justice and equity. So real justice and equity, the understanding of real justice and equity, it comes from the Bible. And when we are not knowledgeable about it, when we don't seek it as for silver or as for treasure and precious metals, then we don't really even know what justice and equity are. And we're just a clanging gong, a noisy symbol just making noise about injustice and in inequity. Verse 10, for when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, then, parenthetically, then discretion will preserve you and understanding will keep you. So here's the relationship. Wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul. Is knowledge pleasant to your soul? Does your soul, does your heart just delight in learning more things? Or have, have you stopped? Have I stopped seeking to learn more about God? Have, have I stopped seeking to learn more about the world around me? I hope that you keep up on news and current events. I hope that you talk to people who are unbelievers and rub elbows with them and do activities with them. I hope you're on a golf foursome or a softball league or a bridge club with unbelievers uh, because we, we all need to be out there rubbing elbows with them. And then when wisdom is, enters our heart uh, and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, the energy that we need to be fueled up to rub elbows every day with unbelievers is knowledge and wisdom. And this knowledge needs to be pleasant to us so that we seek it. We don't go into the mission field without first being prepared for the mission field. That's what this is saying here. Discretion then will preserve you and understanding will keep you. 
So before a missionary goes out into the mission field, a good mission organization teaches them wisdom about the culture, about the people, about the religious backgrounds of the people and the audience that he's going to. And uh, they give him knowledge. And then, then that missionary, which is you and which is me, um, we can then have the discretion and the understanding that will preserve us and keep us as we go out and do God's will uh, uh, out there in the world. There is not much work that God has for us inside the four walls of the church. Um, yes, there's fellowship. Uh, yes, there is ministry to each other. That's all a training ground. That's all preparation for us to go outside and to talk to unbelievers. And I hope that you're doing that. And as I often encourage folks, if you've shared Christ with somebody five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and you were rejected, that person is in a different place in their life today. Try again. Let me encourage you, try again. If they just rejected you last year, try again. I don't know what that will look like for you. That try again could be just as simple as picking up the phone and saying, hey, let's go to breakfast or something. And maybe you don't have to hit them hard with, with scripture and so on. But um, open up that relationship again. Open up that conversation again. Discretion will preserve you and understanding will keep you. Verse 12, to deliver you from the way of evil and from the man who speaks perverse things. So this, this protection from God is going to do two things here. First, there's two kinds of enemies that will come against us. One is somebody who just wants to hurt you. They just, they just want to destroy your witness. They just want to... Uh, they want to catch you unawares, they want to lay a trap for you, or they want to discredit you. This is, the, this is the foe who would just wish to crush you or destroy you, figuratively speaking, maybe physically, I don't know. In a little while, we're going to see a different kind of enemy, a different kind of foe, who would rather have your cooperation in destroying you, who would like to seduce you. So verse 12, to deliver you from the evil from the way of evil and from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of righteousness, of, I'm sorry, of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness. And so, again, this talk is about all of us are on a path going somewhere. We're either going on a path to righteousness or we're going in a path to unrighteousness, but nobody is sitting still. There is no such thing as neutral, neutral gear or park in the eyes of God. We're either going in reverse or we're going forward or we're going to the right or we're going to the left. And the people um, who speak perverse things and uh, who do evil things, they walk in the paths of unrighteousness. They walk in the ways of darkness. Verse 14, they rejoice in doing evil and they delight in the perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who are devious in their paths. There's a thrill, there's a delight that the unrighteous have in corrupting a saint of God. There's a delight that they have in practicing their kind of unfettered liberty, their freedom, they call it freedom. I just wanna be free to do my thing, do whatever I wanna do. That's not freedom, that's bondage, that's bondage to sin. I'll bet a lot of us in the hearing of my voice thought when we were unbelievers that we, we really didn't wanna become believers because we would have to give up a bunch of stuff and we wouldn't be free, I wouldn't be free to do what I wanted to do. And then when I gave my life to Christ and I dedicated absolutely every aspect of my life to Christ, I realized I don't like those things that I used to do. I don't want to do them. And if and when I would feel tempted to do them, I felt I was in bondage. I felt like it was a bad thing. Like that which gave me pleasure before no longer did. Or that which gave me joy before no longer did. I used to rejoice in doing things that after I became a believer, I didn't rejoice in doing them anymore. There's, that's the, so this is the group of people who would just try to get you off on another path and have you come along with them. 
They would like to bring you straight into darkness to kind of crush you. But then there's a different group of people. Verse 16, to deliver you from the immoral woman. And it says woman here. It could be man. And this is, a, this is about adultery, but it also means any kind of idolatry, any kind of thing that um, is, is seductive, is idolatrous to us. To deliver you from the immoral woman and from the seductress who flatters with her words. We're going to really go into depth on this in Proverbs chapter 7, a very famous chapter about uh, how it, it breaks down just the just the chronology and the steps of exactly how a foolish young man is seduced into adultery by a woman. And it just, he's like a sheep being led to the slaughter. To deliver you from the immoral woman and from the seductress who flatters with her words. So flattery is a key tool to seduction. You're so good, you're so strong, you're better than this. You, you, you don't need that crutch of religion or whatever that seduction sounds like. For who she forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. Now, this is not to say that this adulteress or adulterer maybe even ever had a relationship with God, but the idea is this, that um, he or she who is this tempter or temptress uh, is abandoning all possibility of... Uh, pursuing God, and instead they pursue unrighteousness. So she forgets the covenant of her God, and uh, she has, she's not walking in the ways of God at all. And as I said, we'll see more about this temptress, this adulteress in chapter 7. And it, it, now verse 18 goes into a little bit more about the adulteress, the temptress or the temptor, her house, verse 18, for her house leads down to death and her paths lead to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they, nor do they regain the paths of life. This is truly frightening. When somebody allows themselves to be seduced, when, by the way, seduction is something in which we participate. The previous evil person that we studied in verses 12 through 15 they can just do something bad to you without your cooperation. But the seductress requires your voluntary submission, your voluntary participation. That's really scary because this is where her steps lead. Her house leads down to death. So the picture here is you go into the house of the seductress or the person who's leading you into something seductively. And it's like, hey, did I ever show you what I've got down in the basement? Let me show you. And so he or she opens a door and you go down these steps and he or she says, it's really cool, you're gonna like this, come with me. And those steps lead down to death. It's like a horror movie. And her paths lead to the dead and none who go to her return. This is final. We can be seduced away from the faith. I'm not going to get into the whole predestination and eternal security thing tonight. We can do that another time. But let us not, I think even my predestinarian brothers would agree with, with this, let us not rest in the security, our feeling of the security of our position while we use it as an opportunity for sin. What then? Shall we sin all the more that grace may abound all the more? May it never be, says Paul. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. This is a one-way street. But, Here's the good news. It'll be different for you because I know you're not going to you're not going to follow her and neither am I. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. That is when you pursue God's wisdom. For the upright verse 21 will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it. So now this is starting to get into like promise territory. 
promise territory. It's starting to sound like uh, something that we can count on. And again, this is the book of Proverbs. So there's no formula here. There's no guarantees here. But the gist is this. Seek wisdom. Let me go back to it here. Treasure wisdom's commands. Incline your ear to wisdom. Apply your heart to understanding. Lift up your voice for understanding. Seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures. And then you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find the knowledge of God. And that is the knowledge which saves, which preserves, which shields, which guards those who walk uprightly. So it's incumbent upon us to walk uprightly. And then these promises are in, are, are in our reach, are in our grasp. Again, not a guarantee. For the upright will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But, verse 22, the wicked will be cut off from the earth or the wicked will be destroyed from the land and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. This is a principle of, of that, that evil does not prosper, that sinning does not prosper, that liars will be found out eventually. There's no timetable given to us here. And all of these bad things happen to people because they refuse to pursue the wisdom of God with all their heart. And the good things happen not because we claim salvation in Christ, but because we pursue wisdom in God, because we pursue God and we seek to know God, the Holy One. I'd like us to discuss this tonight in our Zoom meeting um, about what the difference looks like, the difference between claiming Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and actually walking with Jesus. I'd like us to discuss maybe examples from your own life about... Uh, you don't have to use names, but about times that you have seen people who were believers suffer shipwreck. We call it shipwreck in their faith. The picture is of a ship that's sailing along well, stormy seas come, and then the ship either goes down or gets crushed on the rocks. It's, a, it's like a painting, it's like a picture, um, but it describes very well uh, a loss of a blessed walk with Jesus. What were the temptations? What, what was the methodology that got that person, or perhaps it was you, that got you there or got them there? Was it being besieged by the evil ones who can come and attack? Or was it by being seduced away by somebody who brought just something that was too tempting to you or to them? Um, perhaps a sexual relationship, or perhaps um, the allure of prosperity uh, business. I personally have seen this where people stop fellowshipping. They stop um, associating with the people of God. They stop pursuing knowledge of the Holy One because they're too busy with business. They're too busy with their career. Um, sometimes, I'll give you one example, uh, without mentioning any states or names or time periods, but I have seen friends uh, move for career reasons to a different place, and they never really plug in. I mean, they were like going gangbusters at church and in their faith walk and raising their children to fear the Lord, and then they, um, they move to another place and they never plug into a church, and they, they have these good intentions of it. And they never, uh, they never come into submission to any kind of church authority or accountability structure or women's Bible study or men's Bible study. Or they say, uh, well, I hang out with my Christian friends at Starbucks and we have our fellowship there and we 
talk about our Christian lives. And that's my church. That's my fellowship. Really? We're going to get into this uh, soon in, uh, in one of our studies coming up. And it's going to be about the church and why I believe in the church, the safety of accountability to other believers like me who protect me through their uh, calling me out on my sin or on my wandering. Do you have somebody in your life who you've authorized to do that? And I'm not talking about somebody who's at the other end of a phone a thousand miles away. Do you have somebody in your life today who lives locally, not 500 miles away, lives locally? Better would be multiple people who can come to you and say, what are you not telling me? What, uh, how is your spiritual walk? Is there something that you're hiding from God? Is there something that you need to confess? Do you have somebody who can ask you that and you not kick them out the door or you not feel insulted by it? Do you have somebody like that that you would answer honestly? And if so, have you invited that person to ask you the hard questions? See, we might all say, oh yeah, yeah, um, I've got this friend and you know, if he ever saw something or she ever saw something in me that was gross sin, I would listen to them. Okay, good. Have you invited them to speak into your life? Have you gone to them and said, I want you to check in with me from time to time, two weeks, a month, whatever it is, and ask me some hard questions about my life. I want to be held accountable and I'm authorizing you to ask me awkward, embarrassing questions. Have you done that? That's important. And it could be a spouse. Certainly our spouse we should listen to in that way. And certainly we should invite, if you are married, you should invite your spouse to be able to approach you in that way. Full stop. That's just every marriage. It should be like that. But probably you need somebody else too. Somebody who's not your spouse. Somebody who's got flesh on who can talk to you. And so that's my encouragement to you. And find someone in maybe in your church or maybe in another church who is like that. I just leave you with those thoughts and let's talk about that tonight. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Lord God, thank you for this time in your word. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 10 through 22. I ask you, God, to, uh, to give us the kind of humility to find somebody who can speak into our lives who we can be accountable to, who we invite in. I ask you, God, to um, keep us protected from the, the foreigner who flatters with words, who would seduce us away from the faith, who would seduce us away from, with our full participation and cooperation, seduce us away from our commitment to you and to your holy church. In Jesus' name, amen. Good. We'll see you at the Zoom meeting.